see you, all these beautiful faces out here in, uh, I guess it's autumn, right? Autumn afternoon on this crazy world that we're living in. Uh, my name is Keith Joseph Atkins. I am the artistic director of the New Black Fest. We have been around, literally, this is our 13th year this week, uh, which is unbelievable. Um, I'm very grateful um, to Frank for inviting the New Black Fest to be part of the Prelude Festival 2023. Um, the New Black Fest has a little history with um, Frank and the Martin Siegel Theater. We have uh, premiered all of our social justice anthologies with them um, going back to 2004, I believe. And we've had three or four of them. So grateful to be here. Um, the way this event's gonna work this afternoon, basically you're gonna hear four excerpts of four brand new plays by incredible actors. Um, each playwright will come up before their play is read and talk very briefly about the excerpt and the larger context of the play. Then the reading will happen and then we'll break and have another play, playwright, so on and so forth. Following the readings, which should last about 70, 75 minutes, We'll have a quick, not quick, but we'll have a nice panel discussion uh, moderated by Robin Walker Murphy, who is sitting right here. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, survival and resistance um, and using these plays to sort of jump off that conversation. All right, so thank you again. Um, I'm very excited. Um, first up is Jeannie by Haley Spivey. How are you doing today? All right, my play is called Genie. The idea of it is the genie is out of the bottle. So this is about a group of old friends who have an annual tradition of coming together for a single night where they are expected to tell the truth, the entire truth and nothing but the truth, including white lies, big secrets they might have been hiding throughout the years. And it's an opportunity where they can ask each other the questions about their lives and beliefs and actually get an honest answer back. Um, and it's a challenge to see how authentic that they can actually be and see how difficult it is to do that. Um, the reason I wrote this play is I'm just very fascinated by the idea that we all have two sides of ourselves, especially when you go to a party setting, the idea is you wanna show up and be the best version of yourself. But what happens if you go to an environment where no one expects you to be the best version of yourself? Um, so this excerpt here is, I chose this one here because it's a nice experimentation about where different characters have different alliances to themselves, to their partners, to their friends in the room. Um, and just a moment where the truth becomes a little bit harder to tell. Catherine enters the bedroom. She looks around. She touches the curtains. She picks up a few framed photographs while hitting her vape. She sits on Tosh and Daniel's bed. She bounces a little to test it out. She lies down on her back and spreads out her limbs. She picks up a pillow. She searches the inside of the pillowcase. She looks under the bed. She pulls out an old shoe box and rifles through it. She finds a passport. She flips through it. She finds a folder with various papers. She scans them. She runs her fingers across the top of the dresser. She opens a drawer. She rifles. She pulls out their underwear. She puts it back. She finds a jewelry box. She pulls out the pearls. She puts them back. She pulls out the diamond ring. She puts it on her finger. She opens the closet door. She pulls out gowns and then a suit. She holds them to her body. She keeps digging. She finds a wig. She wears it. She laughs. She 
She finds a pair of lace up thigh high leather latex boots and a whip. She tries to crack it. Can't quite figure it out. Off stage, we hear footsteps running up the stairs. Catherine quickly but coolly returns the boots, wig, and whip. She quickly moves to the sweet bathroom and shuts the door behind her. Tosh enters. She sits on the bed, frantically dabs a cloth over the giant red stain on her blouse. God damn it. She doesn't want to cry. She takes a few deep breaths as she regains her composure. Rosa enters. You okay? Mm-hmm. We can stop. We don't need to play anymore. <laughs> Honestly, call it. Someone calls it every year. Not me. Well, this is your one time, and that's fine. No, no. That wasn't the game, okay? That was revenge. He's got me back. Good on him. No, not good on him. We're supposed to let this shit go. Every year is a new game, new no grudges. Okay. All right. Gosh, why are you so beat up? This happens every year. This time it just fell on me. I'm not beat up. I'm fine. I'm just cleaning up my shirt. Okay, well, we might as well call the game because clearly you're not playing anymore. What? Well, what do you mean? You're lying. You're sitting here lying to me, telling me that you're okay when obviously you're not. You want to lie, then end the game. Okay. I am not okay. That was brutally humiliating. But I asked for it. So I don't get to sit here licking my wounds. This is the game. A noise from the bathroom. Rosa and Tosh look at the door. Hello? Catherine emerges. Pat. You're in my bathroom. Mm-hmm. For a particular reason? Nope. So she gets to lie. How come she gets to lie? Catherine, don't no. lie. Fine, I was hitting my thing. On the toilet? It's the only place Bolton won't look. Oh, really? Bolton, the man who's known for his wonderful boundaries and ever constant respect. Rosa. You know what that man did to Pat downstairs? What happened downstairs? How long have you been up here? What happened to your shirt? He shamed her, humiliated her. He's been stalking her financial records for the past year and a half. Oh. 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 Okay, so you did know. No. How about a heads up the next time? No. What happened to women sticking together? You know, we could learn something from the men. Men know how to have each other's back. You saw the way they stuck together downstairs? Mm. Band of the brothers. Each socially gangbanging Tosh until she's tear choking on their misogynistic cops. Meanwhile, Cuck Daddy Daniel sits in the corner with his rectum shriveled up all the way to his wisdom teeth. Bro, oh, shut up. up. They're assholes. We get it. I'm serious. What the hell was that? Yeah, okay. Genie's out the bottle. I get it. But Dan, he just sat there and he let them read me. If Morgan hadn't poured her entire drink down your shirt, we'd still be down there. Aren't you pissed? Yes, I'm pissed. I'm fucking pissed. Daniel is a coward. No shit. What's new? Tosh scrubs her shirt furiously. I'm going to get him next year. Just you wait. I'll find everything. This is getting a little ominous for me. Captain goes to leave. Don't lie and pretend like you didn't know that that was going to happen. Why else were you hiding up here? Sick of everyone playing in the middle. I'm not. Well, you barely said shit either. I was vaping. <laughs> You're hosting. You love this game more than anyone. You're just upset you finally got pushed into the hot seat. Finally, you've been waiting. Remember when this used to be about intellectual debate? A night where we can present the ideas and worries that challenge us. Maybe take a stab at status quo and see what lies beneath conformity. Now it's turned into who can find out the dirtiest laundry. You can't lecture me about that when it's your husband walking around with my socks in his hand. A knock on the door. What? Morgan sticks her head in. Hi. I just want to say I'm sorry about the wine. <laughs> I'm a little drunk. Oh my God. It's fine. It was a really pretty top. Yeah. I, I feel so bad. I, I love silk. I'm really sorry. Dan made a martini. I don't drink martinis. It's fine, Morgan. Can I come in? Now it's not a great time. Oh. Are you guys talking about me? No. Okay. But I can't come in? Fine, Morgan. Please, come in. <laughs> Morgan enters. No one says anything. She smiles at them. She sits down on the bed. So, what did you need? 
I just wanted to make sure you weren't mad at me. I'm not. Okay. It's just, you all left me downstairs. What? You left me with the men. All the women were up here and I was with the men. What were they saying down there? Hmm? What else do they know? Or did they turn on you next? Oh, no, 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 no. I bet they sent you up here. See what we're saying, huh? Andre wants you to report back, huh? No, they weren't talking about you. Well, actually, they do suspect you had a few surgeries last spring, so I'd be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, fuck, fuck. <laughs> we didn't mean to leave you. I'm just trying to change my shirt. Yes, of course. Are you all changing your shirts? I'm hiding. I'm talking shit. <laughs> if someone spilled wine on me, I talk shit about them too. We're not talking about you at all. Like this has nothing to do with you. Morgan gets more comfortable on the bed. Okay, great. What are you talking about? About how all your husbands are snakes, slithering, wet baby chicken eating snakes. <laughs> Tosh opens her drawers for a shirt. She pauses. Did you go through my drawers? No. I mean, sure, but we do the same to them. We just gotta coordinate better next year. Can mm -hmm. I look through your closet? No. <laughs> the hosts have to show. I asked, so you have to open. Are you kidding me? Can I have a break? Can I have a five fucking second break? You're a host. Babe. Come on, I've never played before. I want to experience it all including the complete invasion of privacy. Morgan runs to the closet and begins rummaging. Have fun. Anyways, Catherine, are you not disturbed by the glee your husband demonstrated as he financially passed your friend? I wasn't there. I didn't get to see it. Tell me. Honestly, this is me asking. This is me expecting the truth. Bolton has anger problems. He's had two online affairs with Instagram models named Kit Kat and Too Sweet for You. He loves to humiliate your friends. He humiliates you. And Sherry on top, he is racist. What do you love about him? He's not racist. He went on a 15-minute rant about how he could never be attracted to a Black woman. Uh, he loves Black women. Trust me, I've seen his porn history. He's just saying that he took you off. He strategically uses inflammatory, racist conversations just to get a rise out of Black people. None of this bothers you? Why does he have to be attracted to black women to be a good person? Are you kidding me? Morgan, uh, <laughs> not everyone is attracted to everyone. That's fine. People have types. Are you? Are you? Oh my God. Are you defending a white supremacist? He's not a white supremacist. Just because you haven't found the hood doesn't mean it's not in the closet. <laughs> Honestly, I think he's just an asshole. We have to do a complete psychological evaluation of him, but let's save the money. He's just an asshole. You guys are great. I love hanging out with you. <laughs> what do you love about him? You just do. She likes assholes, whatever. <laughs> he makes you small, Catherine. That's all I'm saying. When you stand next to him, I don't even see you. Well, I'm there. Sometimes being small is useful. It's a little easier to go unwatched. Morgan gasps with excitement. She pulls out the whip. She cracks it. Fun. So, is that what you've been doing all night? Being small so the hot seat is off of you? Yeah, you didn't have all this personality downstairs. <laughs> Are you kidding? I'd love to be in the hot seat. I haven't been Jeannie all night. You guys are all so self-obsessed. No one asked me a single question. I've been so bored. I don't know what any of you guys are talking about. La, la, la is what's happened at the Alpha Party in 2008, blah, blah, blah. Why did you lie to me once six years ago? And why are you committing acts fraud? Come on. <laughs> You're a little bitch. <laughs> Morgan cracks the whip. Oh, I see. You're fun. You're a fun girl. I am. Mm. Okay then, ladies. Bless you. Morgan hops onto the bed excitedly. Why are you engaged to Andre? That sinkhole of life and ease? Is it for his money? Maybe. Probably. That and because he follows the rules. Do you love him? 
Or, what do you mean, sure? I mean, if he died tomorrow, I feel so. And that's what he could live up? I don't want to marry something, someone I love, love. No, I want to marry someone I can respect and spend time with. Why not love? If I married a man who excited me or made me feel especially seen and understood, then I'd end up with some asshole like both. I know myself. I shouldn't marry the man I love. I should marry a man who will support me and follow the rules. Okay, so you're only marrying Andre because he's rich and he won't cheat. You act like those are the only rules we follow. What other rules? And you're not worried he's only marrying you because you're young and beautiful? He's marrying me for that and because I follow the rules. What are the rules? The same ones you've been complaining about all night. The gender charades, bullshit. Andre wants a wife who stays small, is well-behaved, doesn't disagree, doesn't always stray, prays to God, cooks, cleans, works hard enough to prove she isn't using him for money, but not so hard that he ever needs to put her job first. He wants a good wife, a woman who follows rules. Now that's honesty, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, uh, and what are you getting in return? A man with status, a man who always drives, pays, never stops working, even if it breaks him. A man who doesn't cry, doesn't require me to hold him and talk about his little feelings. A man who is so unconcerned about my daily life that I can do whatever I want and he's off doing whatever he wants. A man who won't care when the kids love me more. A man who comes home, shuts up, eats his dinner in front of the TV, fucks me, and doesn't complain about the burden that is life. Morgan cracks the whip. Cool. Give me my whip. Morgan hands it over. She crawls under the covers. I want to be clear. My marriage looks nothing like this. Well, your marriage is something else. Why are you in my bed? I'm just following my impulses. Don't. No. But we're supposed to be truthful tonight. And what does that have to do with you touching my sheets? You said at the beginning that tonight is about complete and utter honesty. No hiding, no lying. I'm not hiding my impulses. Think about all the teeny tiny ways we cover ourselves from others. You want to scream, but you don't scream. You want to get into the sheets, but you won't get into the sheets. Where's the truth? I like her, Tash. I think she is deeply brainwashed and to some degree broken, but at least she's not gaslighting herself. <laughs> Eyes, Catherine. Thank you. Rosa crawls into the bed with Morgan. Okay, when you have sex, does he choke you? I choke him. Downstairs, downstairs. Everybody go downstairs, get out of my closet, get out of my bed, don't touch my fucking bed. <laughs> When both of my hosted, you watched my sex tape. Oh, the tape that both conveniently left out? The one you didn't turn off? This entire night is disgusting. This aim is disgusting. Don't pretend like you don't know it, and don't pretend like you don't like it. Catherine snatches the whip and crawls into bed. Go fucking crack this shit. Look at this. Catherine cracks it. Oh, this used to be fun. This is not fun. Well, it's a good time so long as you're not in the hot seat. It feels good to confess, to tell the truth. I never get to tell the truth. We lie, we lie, we lie, we lie. I have sense. I want to confess. Why, so we can fill your need for attention? You need attention too. We all do. Daniel's always running around, filling wine and making martinis, looking for a thank you like a dog looks for a treat. Andre is parading me around like a show. Bolton is just Bolton. And then there's us. Then there's you. And you. No. No. You don't think you sought attention tonight? No. I really don't. Andre said you begged to host. You couldn't wait to drop the price of every little vase and candlestick in this place. And we haven't even touched the top topic of you and Bolton's obsession with each other. Well, let's not rub that bottle. Morgan climbs out of the bed. I think I'm ready to go downstairs. She climbs out of the bed. 
I'm sorry. It sounded like there was an implication there. What happened to following your impulses? I'm remembering why we don't act like this in regular life. I'm ready to go down. I'm sure Andre wants Forzy to come back to the stables. I'm just gonna say, if we're being honest, like you want, I don't want Andre to marry you. Her. You know, there's always a point in the night when it stops being fun. Usually it's around the fourth martini. This is usually when people go home, maybe with it. <laughs> Morgan, you want to be the good little wife? You should do that. Go downstairs and wrap yourself around your fiance's arm. Let's call it. Well, you don't want, want to end the night too early. How else are we supposed to find out what's going on between Kat and Dan? Say that again. <laughs> There's something going on between Kat and Danny. You know, it's always the loud ones that get the attention, but you quiet ones? They look at Catherine. Catherine scoffs. She's lying. Lying would be against the rules. Morgan, I want you to leave. You don't believe me? I want you to go. Because it doesn't matter if you believe me. Now. Because we're always going to follow the rules. Morgan exits. All eyes on Catherine. Hot seat. She crawls out of the bed. Dan would never do that to you. Hush. Morgan's just one of those girls. You knew it when you saw her. Are you wearing my ring? All eyes on Catherine's finger. That's my ring. It was in my case. I put it away. I know I did. That's mine. Tosh lunges at Catherine. Catherine screams. Tosh yanks the ring off her finger while shoving Catherine to the floor. Tosh stands over you. You could have asked. Just ask. I would have shown you. Just fucking ask. A sob. Catherine pulls herself to standing. She recovers. You left it out. It was on the dresser. I was just looking at it. Catherine exits. Tosh collapses on the ground and sobs. We're done, okay? We're gonna call it. The game is over. Did you know? Tosh. Did you know? This is me asking. I thought they had stopped. Dip. Probably stopped. It's over. The game is over. Oh? <laughs> right when I'm finally out the hot seat? I don't think so. We're done. It's my party. You don't get to tell me when to stop. Tosh wipes her face and straightens her new blouse. She laughs to herself. <laughs> All right. Back downstairs. It's almost time for dessert. End of play. So the next play up is called The Heat Will Kill Everything, and that is actually by me. <laughs> um, so I don't usually uh, talk about my plays like this, but I'm going to go ahead and try to explain it to you. Um, so this uh, play is loosely, I don't know, it's probably not loosely, but I'll say this. I am very much interested in climate change. Um, as well as toxic patriarchy. And for me, the way the planet is heating up, it's like a crucible for all of us. And it's going to challenge or it can challenge all aspects of our sociology, our psychology, our gender expression, our gender power. And so this play, The Heat Will Kill Everything, is about a middle-aged Black man during a incredible heated climate event and his daughter goes missing. 
and he must discover for himself why she ran away. The excerpt you're about to hear is the first part of the play. Um, we meet the main character whose name is Leiden. He discovers, he's telling you a little bit about the context of what's happening. And he also discovers that his daughter, Asha, has disappeared on the hottest day ever recorded. All right. So introducing Corey Jackson. An upstage screen displays a rapid fire collage of climate change images. A F5 tornado, an ice shelf collapses, drought hit farmland, heavy coastal flooding, wildfires. Lights rise on a solitary black man. He could be British, Canadian, American, African. His name is Leiden, 40s, educated, warm, and occasionally code switches. He stands on stage and speaks to us. It was uh, the autumn before the floods when my daughter disappeared. Temperatures rose above 120 degrees for weeks. Vegetation wilted, animals, insects, cows. Water was scarce. Black and brown people and the poor were impacted the most. It was a disruption of epic proportions. Scientists warned us about it. Melting glaciers, psychotic climates, the vanishing of monarch butterflies. They said it would be irreversible and they were right. The authorities, as you can imagine, begged people not to go outdoors. Every hour, on the hour, they told us the heat was dangerous, catastrophic, that it would have no mercy for human life, any life. Some of us didn't believe it. Some of us believed more in challenging the truth than the truth itself. I wasn't one of those people. I watched documentaries, read articles, paid close attention to the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. If they sounded an alarm, I acquiesced, took note. But more important, I prided myself on being responsible. I was an educator, a voter, a father of an 11-year-old daughter. My sole purpose was to protect her, to make sure nothing absolved her sweet life. Responsibility guaranteed that. A projection, lights shift. On a Monday morning, a large plume blackened our skies. The news reported it was smoke from forest fires, a common occurrence these days. A podcaster said it was from a chemical explosion and not to believe anything the news says. If you did, you were an idiot and worthy of extinction. Not sure I agreed, but there was no ash, no toxic smell, just darkness. I thought it was our end, our final bump from Earth, and, and that it was justified. A projection, life's shift. I was born here in this country. So were my parents, the great, great grandparents before them. To suggest our lives have been easy would be a slap against historical fact. We are black and that's synonymous with a complicated existence. Have we flourished for generations? But that didn't happen without a fair share of systemics and isms. Like everyone else, we also burned fossil fuel, built homes and destroyed forests. We've ignorantly and knowingly exploited the planet. A dark plume of doom would have been the obvious finale. Instead, the opposite happened that Monday morning. It was a reprieve, a, a climate reprieve, if, if one could say that. The dark plume actually blocked the sun. 
dropping the temperature 30 degrees in 20 minutes. It was miraculous. It was still hot, don't, don't be mistaken, but the air felt cool, tolerable. In comparison, for the first time in weeks, I was happy and wrong. Doom had not showed its ugly head in my life, so I thought. A projection, life's ship. What happened next was commotion, shouting, screaming. I was sure someone had been found dead, but then I heard laughter. It, it was odd to hear after so many weeks of silence. Even birds were chirping. I ran to the window, of course, to see the matter. Neighbors were in their yards, opening champagne, jumping through sprinklers, celebrating. I understood. That heat felt like a, a death sentence, and, and we suddenly got an exoneration. I went to my daughter's room, Asha. I was anxious for us to go out and celebrate. You see, I was a divorcee with partial custody and Asha's three day visitation had turned into weeks due to the weather. And she thrived on the outdoors. It was her sacred space of, of curiosities and the weeks inside were killing her spirit. We were about to get a climate break. I knocked on her door several times, but she didn't answer. I, I wasn't surprised at first. Asha always slept hard, a byproduct of her preemie days. More rest, more growth is what the doctors told us. You had to knock hard if you wanted to wake her, and, and I knocked several more times. Asha, sweetie, Asha. She never responded. A projection, lights shift. Well, I stepped into a room, something I promised I'd never do without permission, but I'm glad I did. Her, her bed was empty, slept in, but not occupied. I, I called out again, but still nothing, which was, which was odd. She, she would at least answer. I'll be there in a sec, daddy. You need to learn patience, daddy. Asha was sweet like that independent but caring. I touched her sheets, they were warm, so I, I knew she had to be close. But I noticed her blue Adidas were gone and her backpack. I, I was not going to panic. That would have been easy to do, but I refused. I, I pillaged through the house, calling for her, yelling, Asha, where are you? I, I'm not in the mood for this type of game this morning. Then I remember telling her if it was too uncomfortable at night, too warm, she could sleep in the tub. She wasn't there either. I ran outdoors, circled the house. I checked the garage, the interior of the car, any place that would provide comfort for a child and heat like that. My neighbors whistled over to me. I, I knew I looked unhinged. They asked if all was okay to have some champagne and relax. Asha is missing, my daughter, I can't find her. I mentioned the blue Adidas, the dark plume, no one saw anything, no one saw her. A few said, I didn't know you had a daughter, Lee. That cut deep. How is it possible you didn't know I had a daughter? She's not invisible. Is it because she's black? Is, is that what you're saying? Because that's really fucked up. They snarled out of confusion, I assumed, or perhaps uninterested in race and gender in their moment of celebration. I was a legit buzzkill. But between the time the temperature dropped 30 degrees and my knock on her door, Asha disappeared. That was a fact. A projection, lights shift. I'm not a perfect man by any means. Let me tell you that right now. I swallow my anger more than I express it. I was fired from university for fudging the grades of a few male students. I had an affair with a doula and ruined my marriage. My doctor says the polyps in my colon could turn cancerous if I don't get my shit together and change my diet. And living in this country stresses me the fuck out and sometimes cognac reverses the stress. But none of that 
should have justified Asha's disappearance. To put my parenting into question? Because I know that's what's happening right now. You hear a story like this, you see a black man like me, and, th and that's what you think. My past should be drudged up, criminalized. Any slither of evidence for you to have reason to hate or accuse me, or to disregard the story I'm telling and walk out. I gave Asha my best. She only knew the part of me that shines. If we're lucky, children do that for us, illuminate our good. The heat waned that morning and something dreadful happened to my child. A projection, life's shed. I had no other choice but to go to the local precinct. I, I was weary though, the last time I was there, they put me in handcuffs in front of Asha. She and I had dressed as an African king and princess for Halloween and someone called the police. They said some black nationalist was walking around making people uncomfortable. Asha had nightmares about that for weeks, but I knew what I was admitting by going to the precinct. Like most men, we want to believe we're naturally armored and capable, but I needed fast results. And I know what a few of you are thinking. His brain must be cracked. A black man with a history with the police going back to the police for help. But for me, locating children was the one thing the police did well. What I didn't expect was for them to pull out their blocks. They claimed I was anxious, that they felt threatened. I explained I was there to report the disappearance of a child. Look, I woke up. She was gone. She's 11, has, has a, a mole on her cheek. They didn't care. They saw my face, body, my anguish, and couldn't differentiate between a black man in distress and one that's a threat. We're in the middle of devil heat. People are dying, and, and your instinct is to shoot me? A rookie cop recognized me from university. He told him I was a, a good dude, decent a real legit professor. You know, thankfully, his vouching worked. My humanity got legitimized. They lowered their guns. You know, one officer was sent to my house to search for foul play, evidence for anything I wasn't telling them. The others sat me in the room. Do you give her drugs? Had you beaten her? Are, are you a bully? Were you sexually inappropriate? Hell fucking no to all the fucking above. I love my daughter and my daughter loves me. The only thing I'm guilty of is unfathomable worry. The interrogation ended on an up note, thank God. They pledged to issue a missing person report and an amber alert. I was grateful for both. I wanted to know how fast that was going to happen. Today, tonight, tomorrow, will you, will you search for her yourselves? Can I search with you, follow you? Are, are you, are, are you all listening to me? I was instructed to go home. They insisted it was too dangerous for me, against protocol. They, they said if Asha was alive or if anybody had abducted her, pray they follow the plume. It was 20 miles in diameter and weather officials confirmed whatever it was, however bizarre, and it had pooling capabilities. Wherever the plume goes, the air would be bearable, safe, they said. Just keep my phone closed. But I had other plans. You can't tell this black man if his daughter is alive and expect him to sit and be obedient. I may have valued responsibility in this symbolic world, but I was very selective about whose rules I obeyed. A projection, life shift. The call I had to make to Asha's mother was the hardest thing I ever had to do. To tell a woman you lost a child. I nearly went into a, an arrhythmia thinking about it. What words to use, what tone, how she would react. I knew I had to bring facts to a black woman, but I didn't want to deliver, debilitate her, break her. Trina, my ex, was already salty that my three day weekend with Asha turned into a shelter at home. Except for FaceTime, 
She had not seen or heard or held her child in over a month. Since my infidelity, Trina goes out of her way to remind me of my failures. And she's accused me of being self-centered, misogynist, which I guess was partly true. But now she was able to add neglectful father to her list. She's missing, Trina, not dead. The police are looking. They, they said to be optimistic. She was initially silent. I didn't, I didn't hear her inhale or exhale, like her, her spirit blacked out. Then she exploded. I knew something like this could happen with you. What if she's assaulted, trafficked? These shelter at homes wake the sleeping diabolical dragons in people. What a fuck up. What a degenerate. I tried to assure her that Asha would be fine. She was smart, resourceful, athletic. She earned trophies and soccer, honors and, and reading comprehension. Asha was born during the North Side riots. That was huge in, in this part of the world. If, if you don't recall the story, a 15-year-old black teen was accused of stealing a pair of socks from a local store. He, he was arrested and died in police custody. His back had been broken. Thousands poured into the streets, chanting, marching. I was teaching uh, black resistance that semester and, and took my students. I thought protest would be a good experience for them to feel what many of our ancestors felt when they said no more to domestic terrorism. I brought Trina. She was seven and a half months pregnant. It's a beautiful moment. Me, me, my expectant wife, my students, and so many others devoted to Black resistance, showing up for the life of a Black boy. You know, I didn't anticipate the fight. People throwing bleach and rocks, shooting. Trina, Trina's water broke in the midst of that, and Asha slipped out and into my hands, right on the street right into the chaos. Trina blamed me for days, months. She said, I forced her to go. She said, I seduced her with, with bullshit about community and allies. Girls get jacked up by cops every day, leading, and you never make an effort to march for them. Never. Bottom line, you gave zero fucks that you risked the life of your wife and child because it's always about you and your importance. All others be damned. A projection, light shift. Contrary to what Trina ever thought, I carry loads of guilt about that day. Every birthday, every time Asha coughs, gets the flu, sleeps too hard, complains about her small size, I'm reminded how she was forced into this life early because of my selfish whim. And before Trina hung up, she made, she made me shudder. Apparently, whenever Asha returned from our weekend, she'd tell Trina she was deeply worried about me and cried. What is wrong with it, that, that it would concern her like that, Lee? I don't even know what you're talking about. What do you mean she's deeply, deeply worried? You've got something irreversible stewing inside of you, and now our little girl is seeing it. You don't have any business with women in your life. I side-eyed, of course. The hell was she talking about? Well, who in the hell was she talking to? I didn't even have shit stirring inside me. Well, if anything happens to Asha Lee, I'll hurt you. Look, if NASA is right about this heat, that it will melt more permafrost, release methane in our atmosphere, that our present crisis will leap from catastrophic to apocalyptic, my daughter would be okay. She thought like a mathematician, always putting the pieces together, a troubleshooter. Every morning, I'd ask what her plans were for the day, and she'd say, preparing to fix our world, Daddy. Asha was not the type of child who'd worry about anything, especially her father. Trina was dead wrong. A projection, light shift. The first 20 minutes of my search, I speeded through the streets, circled the same areas over and over, looking left to right, right to left, speeding dangerously. The news did say driving a car in heat like that was a risk. Tires could explode, engines could blow. I, I imagine the future of automaking would need to change to prepare for dangers like that. But if someone found my car wrapped around a tree, 
My body shoved through the windshield. Well, my daughter's life was worth inconceivable death. I was not going to tell the police that my plan was to find Asha myself, in case that's what you, you're hoping. Fuck that, Trina too. She was 13 hours away and most flights have been grounded since the heat got bad. It would take her forever to get here. No, I had this. There was nothing on those roads, no people, cars. There, there were dead animals for sure, dozens, deer, coyotes. Their corpses bloated. The rise in animal extinction was on full display. I saw a dog, one of those golden doodles. It was resting on the road. I, I blew my horn. Eh, eh, get out of here, dumbass dog. This heat will eat you up. Then I saw the flies festering on his face. The golden doodle was dead. I remember thinking, how lucky the flies. This weather was paradise for them. It gave them both food and breeding grounds for days. I prayed Asha hadn't seen this. She loved dogs, all animals. I, I prayed I didn't find her but If Asha had been abducted in heat like that, how did it happen? Who did it when? The police said there was no foul play at the house from me or anyone else. Asha just vanished. A projection, light shed. A special emergency broadcast came on the radio. Three F5 tornadoes ripped through some mid-sized city, back to back, 30 minutes apart. I thought it was happening near me, that I was in danger of, of being obliterated by a 175 mile per hour wind, that Asha could be obliterated. I wasn't overreacting. Calm skies could go volatile within minutes these days. My resolve was quick. The tornadoes were on the other side of the country. A man was tossed 1,500 feet from his bathroom to an open field. They found him clutching his six-month-old daughter. One of the worst tornadic events on record. Droughts, ecosystems, fucked. Hurricanes amok. I got it. The end was near. The end was here. The shit had me stressed. It only reiterated the danger Asha was in. Felt like my head was going to explode. I needed a, a I needed calm. Some kind of, of, of meditative elixir. I, I didn't have any cognac, gummies, nothing. I settled on what most black men would settle on, music. Not Marvin or even Kendrick, but De La Soul, me, myself, and I. It may sound random to you, but not to me. It's one of those classics that had a way of making the world feel more hopeful than it really was. I don't care what anyone says, hip hop can save souls. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Tell me, mirror, what is wrong? Can it be my daylight clothes? I was already feeling the spirit, the uplift. <laughs> or is it just my daylight song? What I do ain't make believe. People say I sit in tribe, but when it comes to being daylight, it's just me, myself, and I. You're feeling it, right? Hell, just indulge me. <laughs> just me, myself, and I. Just me, myself, and I. I see you out there nodding. <laughs> oh, now who tease my plug one style and my plug one spectacle? You say plug one and two are here fees. No, we're not. That's your plug book. Yeah, no, no, no. Now you tease my plug one style and my plug one spectacle. Yeah, yeah, help me out. You say plug one and two are hippies. No, we're not. That's pure plug four. Always pushing that we formed an image. There's no need to lie. When it comes to oh. my tire view. A projection. Light shift. I stepped out to see the damage. Oh my God, it was hot. The heat literally sucked my breath, yanked moisture from my skin. I never experienced anything like it. The plume. That, that had been, been hovering, keeping things cooler, drifted. 
The temp jumped to 127. I thought maybe I should, should turn around, let the police do their jobs. Your 15 minutes in heat like that could, could kill me. But that would be given up, leaving Asha to the elements, to the police, to all other ravages set loose in the world. I had to keep looking. I, I put on the spare or try. I, I figured if I placed myself, I could, if I paced myself, I could make the change in five minutes, eight minutes tops, avoid heat stroke, death, Sweat poured from my forehead in, in buckets. You should have seen it. Thought I was going to drown in my own salt water. But I was grateful for all efforts my body was making to cool itself. Yeah, I learned quickly. Don't ever under don't ever underappreciate your biology. Sometimes it really wants you to win more than you do. Salt. See, child's voice pierced the heat. It, it, it was faint, like a, like a whisper. Soft. See, it happened again. I, I wasn't someone who heard things or talked to themselves, so I, so I knew it was something. Daddy, is that you? Daddy, I see you. It was Asha. I recognized her timbre, her curiosity. I, I, I spun around, it, it was my girl, but I didn't see her. I, Asha, honey, honey, yes, it's me, Dad, where are you, Asha? There was another voice, this one was, was older, uh, maternal. Lee, it's us, sweetie, turn around. You've got to turn around. It was my mother and Asha standing together. I swear, hands locked, waving me to follow. The, the, the thing was, my mother had died five years ago of ovarian cancer. But they kept waving me to follow. I, I took a step forward, but Something stopped me in my tracks. A, a man, he was, he was standing behind them. His face was abstract. He was more like a, a silhouette. And his vibe, his essence felt sinister. Then, just like that, my eyes clouded over with sweat. I, I couldn't see anything, hear anything. My pupils burned. The wave of nausea rippled, and I puked. I looked back to where they were, were standing. It was just three trees. The third one larger than the others. I stumbled back into the car and, and down the last bottle of water. Extreme heat exposure. It, it was creating mirages. I, I had read about that. One of the many climate warnings from the WMO. I was hallucinating. I was both glad and it, it broke my heart. I thought it was Asha. I waited until dark before I finished with the tire. It was still hot, but I told myself it wasn't. Re-engineering truth can help you tolerate most things. The real dilemma was gas was low. A projection, light ship. I found a 24-hour gas station that also hadn't run out of gas. When I walked in, I saw a customer standing at the counter, a man. Uh, I then saw the broken beer bottle he was wielding. He, he was screaming at the cashier. My kid's urine is dark yellow and I need water. What's hard to understand about that? Guy looked starved. His, his hair was long, unkempt. His eyes blue, sincere, like, like those images of, of Jesus they wanted you to believe was Jesus. I felt sorry for him. Dark yellow urine definitely meant dehydration. Another climate backlash. He redirected his desperation in me. Give me your wallet. Don't stare at me, give me the wallet. Brother, I can pay you for your water. That's, that's not a problem. I can pay for your water. I have to pay my electric bill, my gas bill, and for food. Shut the fuck up and give me your wallet. He pulled my wallet straight from my pocket. Lie face down right now. I don't want you looking at me, you asses judging. Dude, I'm almost out of gas and I'm trying to find someone. My daughter, 
And I need everything so my kids don't shrivel up and die. Lie down. I left without gas. I could have siphoned some from a vehicle, but there weren't any in, in eye shot, and, and there was a risk of getting poisoned. The only other fix was my father. He lived 10 miles away, give or take. If, if I was a lucky, if I was lucky, I could there, I could be there before the fuel ran out. A projection light ship. Ooh, my father was a man of endless resources. It, it was his brain. It was his posture. He, he was a pillar. And the one person on the planet who could break my spirit in half. He lived in a sturdy house at the end of a tree-lined street, a, a black middle-class utopia, English tutor, four bedrooms, two car garage, a large garden where my, where my mother grew blue puyas. She won a few local landscape awards for that garden. It was one of her biggest joys. My father was king. He loved my mother, but he also silenced her, her intelligence, opinions. My father believed anything he said, did, requested was paramount. All else fell into second place. All else was hushed or flattened. And it always felt like that there was a, an unspoken thing between he and my mother, something that never came to the surface, something defining but unclockable. The last time I saw my father was at the repast for my mom. Five years ago, he and I got in the, one of our many fights. That time was about a pot of beef stew. He insisted on eating it, though it was sitting at room temp for six hours. Leading, if I want to swallow an entire hog and stretch my guts till I split, that's my business. Dad, only a masochist would eat food left out like that. Are you suggesting I'm not intelligent? That I'm too daft to know when food is unconsumable? No, but I'm suggesting an intelligent person would discard the stew. I said that. He leapt towards me like a lion. You know, we stood there screaming about bacteria and salmonella for, for what felt like hours. So you're the only one around here with a, with a drone's eye on shit? But if you want to get sick, get sick. The hell if I can. This is my house. I pay the mortgage. I eat what I eat, how I damn well eat it. Our standoff caused Asha to cry. She was six and rarely shed tears. I'm certain we traumatized her and I hated my father for that. Our screaming match ended with my father stuffing a spoonful of beef stew into his mouth, then telling me to get the hell out and never return. Look, I'm happy not to come back to the place where you killed her spirit. Because whatever that thing is you never discussed, killed her. The words jolted him, but didn't stop his last swing. Good. Now I'm wifeless and childless. Get out. A projection, light shift. Dad let me in like he was expecting me, uh, as if nothing between us had transpired. He had aged a little, gray in his, in his eyebrows and nose, a head of white hair, maybe an inch shorter. His athletic frame had thinned out some. He was old, but still effervescent. I felt a, a little ashamed. Global warming had left a significant mark during the last few years, and not once did I check to see if he was holding up. Lee, you look dehydrated. Let me get you some electrolytes. He walked into the kitchen and brought back some high-end sports drink. The electrolytes will help. Everyone's dehydrated these days. We're, we're being burned out. They're counting on us not to stay hydrated. They want to exterminate us so they can have the planet to themselves. Who's they, Dad? The fucking one percenters. Who the fuck else? Dystopic storms, artificial takeover, late stage asthma. It's the fall of humanity and they love it. We'll just be cops. Watch. 
The house was littered with news clippings about climate change. Every wall, door covered with headlines about rains, methane releases, and the Arctic viral outbreaks. There were cases of water and non-perishables in every corner stacked to the ceiling. Dad wasn't just well, well read in global warming. He had become a hoarder of climate, climate doom. A projection like shift. There was also a shrine of mom above the fireplace. Photos, articles of her clothing, dried kuya flowers from her garden. I didn't think of my mother often. I refused to actually. The last recollections of her bedridden with cancer, my father's blatant denial of her decline, it was a lot to hold. Whenever memory surfaced, I'd beat it back down, but, but dad had taken the time to build the shrine. He had, he had made, made mom permanently visible, unlike in life. I looked over at him and he was staring at me. I started to tell him what happened with Asha, but his eyes were glossed over. I, I know you've seen that look. Not demented, but consumed, obsessed with something bigger than me. Dad, I, I need to tell you, Asha is missing. He didn't blink, change expression. There was no spiritual blackout like with Trina. He nodded as if I confessed to what he'd been thinking all along. I'm trying to find him. Dad, the police are looking, but can I use your trust? The glossiness of his eyes cleared. You know, I don't have to do a damn thing for you. Showing up at my house after five years with the world buckling like it is, you have some fucking God accusing me of being responsible for your mother's death and now asking for a handout? Talk about the flavor of bullshit. I've done everything for you, including give you life and shape it, whether you like it or not. You're so busy thinking you're better than everybody with your degrees and that bullshit good guy shit you do. First your wife leaves, now your daughter. What do you think that means? It means you're no good with women either. You kill their spirits too. Huh? Go find your daughter. He tossed me the keys to his Tacoma. I took them and walked out the door. End of play. Right, another round of applause for Corey Jackson for that read. We are bringing up him, man. Where is she? Um, hi, y'all. Um, so I was with a fuckboy that I couldn't leave. <laughs> I just loved him so much. And I knew his reputation. I knew what he did was wrong. But when it got cold and I got that text, I always answered. And I said, oh my God, this is my relationship with America. I know his reputation. I know what it does is so bad, and yet I'm still here. And that's why I wrote Cinderella's of America.
I, me, my story, so, in my village in Africa, yeah, war, poverty, fly. Okay, fine, I don't have a poetic story. I'm not like them. I'm not a refugee. I'm not running away from a warlord. I don't need some special sort of ARVs for my special strand of African HIV, but I don't know. Always feels like America needs us to prove why we need to be here. Like we didn't contribute to the reason we want to be here. I don't know. I don't know. I do know that since I was a kid, all I saw was America on my screen. Every version of success on my screen was American. Every version of love on my screen was American. Every version of joy on my screen was American. Maybe that's my tragic story, that I never saw those things existing outside of America. But it's different this time, y'all. <laughs> oh, I can feel it. I know things will be different this time. Like, it's going to be different this time, because I have a plan this time. It's going to be different this time. Lights out. Angela. Oh, to the M-E-M-E-M-E. -E -M -E -M -E. <laughs> We are in the apartment of T, who in another world would have been a comedian, magician, or lawyer. In this world, she is all three without any of the qualifications. <laughs> you smell right. I, I haven't showered in 36 hours. I'm hungry, and I can't tell if I have a yeast infection or just a really moist vagina. Yeah, uh, remember that time you said Africans weren't hungry, dirty, and struggling? Yet here you are. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about yourself like that. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Sheila told me to give this to you. Oh, your mom loves me. How is she? Oh, she's good. Trying to become an influencer with 15 followers and five of them on her other accounts. <laughs> uh, how'd she take the news? Obvious. That she about to have a son in law. Oh. Yeah. You didn't tell her you're getting married? I didn't. Girl. She doesn't need to know all that. I told her I booked a big role and that I needed to leave. And then I told my mom's sperm donor, that, that guy, I told him that the least he can do is pay for my apartment for three months. So I'm gonna use that money to pay, what's his name? Phil. Right, Phil. No me hands over a wad of cash to team. See, I have a plan. This time is different. <laughs> you spending all this money to be in this fucked up country? Just to be with you, mi amor. <laughs> Uh -huh. Get off of me. I'll make you a hug on one day. No, you won't. Yes, I will. That's your problem right there. You always think you can change someone. But speaking of change, the someone you are marrying has changed. WTF? WTF? What are we texting? What the fuck? Much better. When were you going to tell me? I just did. What happened with the original dude? He chickened out. Why? He said the money wasn't worth it. You clearly didn't show him my picture. I did. And that's when he said the price wasn't worth it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, wow. What? I'm actually paying someone to marry me. Never would have thought it. You know, in my heyday, I was a cash. You realize I have no use this college, right? You trying to say I wasn't a cash? Yeah. Your ass used to leave coins in your pockets at the airport just to get some action in TSA. Okay? <laughs> Does that sound like someone who was a cash? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so what did you like? Who? My boobs. Just sexy. Like, just sexy and gorgeous and sexy. <laughs> Manly and sexy. Like, like, what kind of sexy? Like, Idris Elba and Denzel Washington had a baby. Why aren't you dating him then? Ah, not my type. You know, I like them. Why? I was going to say older. See, <laughs> let's T licks her finger and sticks it in Nogi's ear. Gross, why are you so childish? <laughs> <laughs> Late night. Um, I was on a date with a brother. You're lying. I'm not. 
You always do that weird thing where you put your non-existent ear hair behind your ear when you lie. I'm not lying. I'm going to decolonize this vagina. Come rain, come sunshine. You know how Lauren Hill says free yourself from mental slavery? Bob Marley, but continue. You out here freeing yourself from vaginal slavery. <laughs> no, 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 listen, I'm serious though. I can't remember the last Chad I was with. And like Tyrone is great and he's real black, okay? Like singing Negro spirituals during sex, black, like just like real, like real, like black. Mm -hmm. like, like don't take off his size 14 tims when he fucking me black like, what in the point of like I even think of like coughing and the brother offered me a ginger ale black <laughs> you nervous nah uh, nah <laughs> I mean it's, it's it's not real what's there to be nervous about <laughs> you're nervous I'm not you always shout when you're nervous. No, I don't. I'm not nervous. I, I just, I just want it over and done with, so I can finally have a chance, you know. And 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 I don't even believe in marriage, so it's just fine. It's all fake, really. Look how marriage turned out for my mom and my dad, and also like five percent of marriage. Yeah, you said made of that statistic. But still, how many marriages do you know that work? Barely any. Yet we hold ourselves up to that standard, and we just praise this thing. We know that's probably gonna fail. Kind of like you in America. Not from time to eat. <laughs> My point is, everyone I know that's married is miserable or pretending not to be. The only difference between my wedding and everyone else's is that I'm aware is one big lie. Is this about Justin getting married? I don't care about he who shall not be mentioned getting married to that model. Instagram models don't count anyway. Oh, I wish them a fruitful, flat tummy tea life filled together. That's besides the point. <laughs> The point is, I don't believe in marriage, and if I gotta fake it, then good for me because everyone is. Also, 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 I am a woman who has had very mediocre sexual experiences. So if I'm good at anything, it's faking things, okay? I'm fine. This is gonna be fine. I'm good. I'm not nervous. I am all good. It's, it's all good. It's okay to be nervous. I got you. And I got you to hug me. Ugh, okay. Your hug expires in three, two, one. Mike, a very white man, comes out of the room in just his boxers doing a sexy dance. <laughs> With my teacup bag. Oh, hello. Oh, shit. Fuck me, even my third hole. <laughs> you must be Tyrone. <laughs> What the fuck are you still doing here, Michael? Didn't know you have company. I told you the bride was going to be staying with me. Oh, the bride. Yes, the bride is I. Nice to meet you. I'm uh, just the, the neighbor, and I, I came to borrow some. Uh, Nailed it. So here you go. You can go now. <laughs> Interesting. I thought you didn't drink milk in your coffee anymore. No, me. See? I'll explain this later. Oh, I got time. So is this a half and half situation or are you more a 2% milk kind of girl? This is 100% vitamin D. Uh, okay. <laughs> Shut up, Michael. <laughs> Damn, your nipples are really pink. Well, it matches my Shut dick. up, Michael. <laughs> You know, I guess now's as good as any time to introduce you to the person officiating your wedding. Oh, this is getting even better. You fucking the pastor that's married? Not a pastor? Not fucking. <laughs> yeah. uh, he already had a license to officiate marriages, and I figured it would save us the drama. Wait, you mean anyone could just marry people in America? Well, not just anyone. I took a course. Oh, he took it online. It takes 30 minutes. I take my job very seriously. I put in the work, and don't act like you don't know what I mean. Shut up, Michael. <laughs> what do you want to do? Ten. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Look, he has a license, and he's white. The whites trust their own. <laughs> you're right. You're right. You're right. Good thinking. Can I get in on that? Hell no. Um, can you put some clothes on? That's not what you were saying last night. <laughs> oh, that's your boyfriend? No. Yes. I personally find nothing wrong with you dating the wife. Thank you. This wouldn't have been the wife I expected, but you know. Wait, wait, wait. What does that mean? 
Oh, no offense. She just normally goes for a. We don't need to be discussing this. Goes for a what? Like, why? But with like flavor. I got flavor. I got spice. I got zest. You know, you put so much powder when you are not talking. Just don't talk. That's because I'm fluent in body language. Oh, so you got over the PTSD? Mm, PTSD. Oh, in college, she dated this one white. Somehow, when you say white, it sounds racist. Black, Black people, people can't be racist. <laughs> she dated a white. We don't need to tell this story. Well, <laughs> they bumped ugly. I hate when you say that. Whilst they fucked, she said she heard her ancestors crying. Yeah, that's uh, that shit is real though. Yeah, I believe you. That that's why I do not do missionary with them. <laughs> the last missionaries who visited our countries made a close our eyes for prayers. When we opened them, whoop, whole country gone. <laughs> oh, no, look. Can't have this cooch belong to nobody but me. That's it. That's why you gotta be on top. You gotta let them know who's riding shit over here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how long y'all been fucking? Know me. I'm just trying to get to know him. And that's your question? It's deeper than that. Deep. You say it. Know me. I've been trying to make T-Mine for six months, if that's what you're asking. So it's serious? It's serious to me. But, you know, I, I get it. She's got a lot on her plate right now. A lot on your plate? What you got on your plate? Just, you know, work and stuff. You sure? Yeah. Uh, well, now that we've all met, you know, I think weddings have you officiated. Including yours, one. T, relax. So we really just do the ceremony and ta-da, married? Yes. Ta-da, married. Oh, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like for addition without them asking me my visa stats. So I'm a green card holder, bitch. <laughs> and in five years, I'll be American. Oh, Hollywood, you're not ready. That's funny. What? Wait, you're serious? Serious about what? You think a green card is what is in between you and your dreams? Oh, 100%. Okay. Okay, what? This acting thing isn't easy. And, and not because of like immigration, just because it's like kind of fucked. Me and all my actor friends. My actor friends and I. My actor friends and I were born in this country and still have party guest number three on our IMDb. I'm not you or your little actor friends. Plus, huh, remember, Lupita, Poyega, Damson, African is in right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying that I'm as American as it gets. What does that I mean? Actually... Well, what does that mean? Uh, as American I'm... as it gets? Why don't we just chill for a bit? Oh, I will chill after Mike, has, Mike tells us what Native American tribe he comes from. You know I didn't mean it. Like oh, that. let's not forget, we are all immigrants here. Uh, not I. My people were brought here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, they were your people too. So sorry to you too. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yes. Sorry. And I am sorry. <laughs> for, for my people and what they did and what they continue to do. And and I know sorry can't take it away, but I do what I can to bridge the gap. Yeah. <laughs> and and you know, I, I didn't mean to, to shit on you. I, I was shitting on how shitty this shitty country is. Shit, it, it's shitty to me. And and the shit people have to go through, it's like shit. <laughs> so I, I can't imagine what shit y'all have to deal with. You have a wonderful vocab. Leave the white man alone. Baby girl, I invite the conversation. Oh, baby girl. Oh, let me help you understand, baby boy. You're an actor who hasn't booked. And chances are you may never book the thing. Yeah. But like, you still try, right? Despite knowing that this industry, in the words of you, is shitty. Yeah. And many people quit. And they come back. And they try. And they quit. Yeah. I've never even had the chance to quit because I've never even had the chance to start. And that feels unfair. I deserve the chance to quit. Like, even if I don't make it, which I highly doubt, I'm choosing this guy. You know, you can't see the ceiling in America. At, at home, life's phone rings. Lil John's Get Low is his ringtone. 
the why the hell is that your ringtone in 2023? Mike Silas is the phone. Uh, thank you for explaining, especially because you, you don't owe me your explanation. Because like I always tell Pete, I'm committed to the work. Okay, whatever, Shante. Mike's phone rings again. Oh, it's Phil. Buzzing you right up. My man, Phil? <laughs> That's right. Ooh, you said you look like Denzel, what else? Girl, 1996 Denzel. Oh, sucky, sucky now. Nah. Knock, knock. In the play. <laughs> Another round of applause for the amazing actors of King's Play. Now we're going to bring up Dennis Allen II um, in his new play, The Venerable Donald Trump. Dennis also directed tonight's excerpts, by the way. Yeah, so I'm tired. Okay. Um, what do you need to know about the play? Um, so John Patrick Shanley wrote a play called Doubt. Um, and if you haven't seen the play, there's also a movie with Philip Seymour Hoffman and Viola Davis and Snotmos. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, though it is a three character play, there is a fourth character. Donald, who we never see and never hear from, but he is the central character to everything that happens in the play. Um, and I personally got get tired of Black bodies being used as devices and being used, um, yeah. So um, I was like, oh, what about, what about Donald? What happened to Donald? Why does no one care really about Donald? Um, and so this is my attempt to humanize a character that was so instrumental in a play that actually is going up again at Roundabout, but we never see or hear. Uh, so I hope you enjoy. priest, Father Muller, mid-forties, dressed in all black. The white of his clerical collar glows below his adamantum. He stands at a podium on the steps of the United States Capitol, unapologetically addressing a million black men. My name is Father Donald Muller. I'm from the Bronx. born and raised. And when I got the call from Minister Farrakhan's people to be a speaker here at the march, my first thought was, heck no. I mean, who was I to speak at such a momentous event? What, what could I offer a million black men? Then they shared with me the lineup for the day and I got, as the kids say, shook. My heck no turned into hell no. Nah. Truly, Jesse Jackson, Dr. Maya Angel, Sister Betty Shabazz, Reverend Al Sharp, Rosa Parks, Stevie Wonder. I have to follow Stevie Wonder? No one should have to follow Stevie Wonder, but here I am. Father Muller from the Bronx, ready to serve. That's what got me up here. My calling to serve. I'm here for you, for me, for God. I was recently reading the Paris Review. It's not a magazine I usually pick up, but my brother is a subscriber and I, I found myself sermon searching. I believe we can find a sermon anywhere. Well, in this particular issue, they were interviewing Nigerian novelist Chinua Achebe and he shared a proverb with the interview. Until the lions have their own historians. 
The history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. I look around at this sea of beautiful black faces and I can't help but wonder how the historians will depict this day. This day of unity, of power, of love. Until the lions have their own stories, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Who are the lions? Who are the hunters? What images are conjured when you hear the words hunter and lion? The lion, king of the jungle, large with a majestic mane, panic producing roar, teeth and claws that can shred a man like paper. Imagine the hunter, what do you see? A man with a gun, a rifle, a, a silly safari hat. He is powerful with that rifle. The, the boom from his rifle is just as panic producing as the roar. The bullets can shred flesh. That rifle levels the playing field, gives the hunter an advantage. Give the, give the hunter an advantage. Even. Can you see? If you trade the rifle for a spear, does the image of the man change? Is he as powerful? Did his race change? Now make the hunter a woman. Does she seem as powerful? A man's voice cuts off Donald's sermon and we're transported from the U.S. Capitol steps to Father Muller's Bronx apartment living. Get on stage. Boo! This is black men. Seriously? Boo! Bring back Stevie! We want the minister. I highly doubt there will be hecklers at the march. So you need to be prepared for anything, bro. Thomas the march is sitting at the Capitol in, in, in DC, not the Apollo in Harlem. Might as well be in a million men's homes, but you're gonna be put brothers to sleep with all that bored ass shit. Okay. Because I'm serious, bro. No no more want to hear these analogies and shit, man. Speak from the heart, not the head. I don't know why I asked you to listen to this. You you have to find because besides mom, I'm the blackest person you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. When you've given a sermon, it, when have you given a sermon to have more than one black face in the pews? You just gonna jump to a million? A million? <laughs> Look, I serve our community. I've always Wait, served. Nobody says so. I know you do your thing in these streets. I said, sermon, preach, convey an inspiring message to folks that ain't milky white. I serve the parish, the bishop assigns. Yeah, we, we, we ain't had the same conversation. You over here being sensitive. Sure. What, Thomas, I'm not I'm being, being sensitive. sensitive. After the sissified? <laughs> Have you taken your medication you gave today? Yeah, you always been thin skin. Don't know how them goose over there ain't get your ass. Don't use that language, Thomas. Have you taken your medication today yet? I am a grown man. I can talk how I want to talk, and I'm fully capable of remembering to take my meds. You, I know you worked so hard to get me in that trial. Broken record. Man, you think I you think I want to die for this shit? You think you got a monopoly on being with it, on being responsible? I'm going to take take it right now. Father Muller looks over his notes. You really don't like the Chinua Achebe quote? See where you're going. Giving our, giving our diasporic asses a taste of Mother Africa and having us contemplate our conditioning as it pertains to life and narrative. But this needs to include a little more flavor to fun it. Meaning? Have you listened to any of the takes I gave you? Illmatic, ready to die, that damn great car joint? I am not. What the fuck was that? What was what, Tom? That this Mr. Tone you got all in the back of your throat. I I am See, not this is where this whole father thing got you fucked up. It is this this holier than now. How you rep the box and don't like hip hop? How you gonna minister to the people, to our people, and you look down on them? I I don't disparage anyone for enjoying rap. It just does not tickle my fancy. <laughs> Kittle your fancy? 
See, this is dad's fault having us up to that mass talking about. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, the Spirit of the Father and the Son, the Father and the Son, the Lord, and the Holy Spirit. But we wouldn't have gotten the schooling and opportunities we got yeah, if we got school, all right? Or we sit in the back corner of the church being treated like we slap Jesus' mama. How many times old boy skip over you doing for you? His body for you, not for you. His blood for you, but never you. Yeah, I distinctly remember mom saying you got sent home for spitting the wine out yeah. and spraying it all over the <laughs> I keep them using a different challenge for me. Always the troublemaker. It's like you had an allergy to anything you deemed unfair. Well, why you got to take your time to see pictures of all sunshine and rainbow? Well, it, it was it was only it's, it was only one year, and I was protected the first half. Protected. Well, I don't own grudges like you. Can't afford to. You think you were protected? You definitely shouldn't be calling Chino and Chibe with way you cake up the white folks. All right. If they don't need a black savior, shit, they don't want a black savior. I'm done. Thank you for listening. Well, when you going to listen? See, black folks don't want to save you either, even if you think they do. And I hope you don't think you're saving me. Thinking of your poor, sick little brother and giving you nothing to do or God find comfort like that. Look, why does everything have to be some argument or debate with you? God, you wouldn't have the rhetorical vigor you got if it weren't for you. I wouldn't have the ulcers I got if it weren't for you. Ha ha ha! <laughs> have you reached out to mom yet? Now, mother's not interested in hearing from me, darling. Well, how do you know if you don't call? Let it go, bro. I you ain't got a campus. He's an old man. Free as a bird. Right? Like, yeah. Had white folks show me a shit last week and dogs dancing around the street. Why? Because Brother Johnny Cochran said, if the glove don't fit, bust the quick. If the glove don't fit, you bust the quick. If the glove don't fit, you must acquit. You can't tell me that ain't rap. Because in language, okay. 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 All, right. all right. See, Blake's got a nigga accused of killing a white woman or Scott. See, what those streets need is a little personal favor. We'll give it in. Listen, take your medication, please. Father Mother Muller begrudgingly hands Thomas the speech. First of all, here's what it is. From the Bronx, born and raised. I can't believe it. In the in the books, you stay corny. All right, Pete. I'm just going freestyle with something like, "I'm Father Donald Muller from the Bronx, New York." When I ran the streets back in the day, they called me Little Donnie. I was weak. Punk. Got my ass jumped every day in public school. And when my father saw I got beat up, he beat me up for losing the fight. So I found God. Father Muller snatches the speech out of Thomas's hands. Okay, all right. I got my ass beat in class. My ass be at home, and now I rep God on that microphone. I got my ass beat in class, my ass be at home, and now I rep God on the microphone. Maybe, maybe not like that, but I'm telling you, it's just be more personal. Father Miller sighs. He flips through the pages of his speech. Take your medication, please. <laughs> All jokes aside, it's a good start. Big bro, it's gonna be historic. I'm serious about making it more personal, though. Thomas exits the room. Father Muller is transported back to the Capitol steps. The Bronx today in '95 is not the Bronx I grew up in in '64. I was the first to integrate into St. Nicholas Catholic School in the Bronx. We all wore uniforms, but I stuck out. 
the, the nuns tolerated me for the most part. My schoolmates, not so much. Their parents, not at all. Only one priest went out of his way to make me feel safe, but, but he wasn't around for long. Then I got older, joined the Marines, went to Vietnam to fight for my country. We all wore uniforms, but I stuck out. My superiors tolerated me for the most part. My fellow Marines, not so much. Americans, when I got home from the war, not at all. Then I found myself back at the church, dedicated my life to God and became a priest. We all wear uniforms. Less than 1% of priests in America are black. The nuns still tolerate me for the most part. My, my fellow priests, not so much. Parishioners here in America. Thomas holds his stomach and says that he's about to pass out. Father Muller moves quickly to him and guides Thomas to the floor. They sit with Thomas positioned between his brother's legs. Man, my stomach can just breathe. Focus on breathing. Got you, it'll pass. Just breathe. Father Muller demonstrates the slow melodic breathing for his brother. With his left arm wrapped around Thomas, keeping their bodies close, and the other hand gently rubbing Thomas's stomach. This continues for a long moment. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Get off me. Right, get off me. Thomas gets to his feet. You ask him random side effects. Did you go see your doctor? He said, I'm good. Pain is a familiar friend. You know how we do. We'll call in the morning. Oh, yo, you got a letter that came in the mail. It's official. Put it over there on the desk. Father Muller goes and retrieves, retrieves the letter. He looks at the envelope, puzzled by the return address. Who's it from? I'm not sure. Father Muller opens the letter. As he reads, a wave of emotion engulfs his body. He steadies himself so he will be swept away. The, uh, uh, you know the father of God, you scared me, man. What happened? The priest from St. Nick that uh, uh, when I was there and he left. Yeah. He's dead. Die. Apparently suicide. Yeah. So he said, why? The man is the reason I became a priest, huh? I, I, allow me to restate. Why we said suicide is an intentional act, is what he wanted. Like I see you upset, and I, and I get someone you leave me dead, but look, man, I know that look, but you, you, you ain't look like that since. The letter, well, it's just to say, say why he did it? No. They requested that I deliver the eulogy. Why you? It was in his will. No, oh, that's weird, brother. Why would he request you? Like, what's up with this cat? No. No. Yo, he was, he was in Ohio. The funeral's going to be in uh, in Ohio. It's, uh, it's great. Lock things. Thomas hugs his brother as he stands stoically, still in shock. It's on Monday. Wait. You? It's coming Monday, the 16th. That's too bad. Life isn't about getting everything you want. Apparently, he did death because he ain't missing that march. We ain't missing this march, right, Donnie? You know, don't play with me, man. Right? 
but it's important that I no, feel no, no, hell no. I right, don't even finish. You're gonna miss one of the biggest events, maybe the March on Washington in 63 for some white man that killed himself that you ain't seen, seen this in like 30 odd years. It's still gone. That fast, that quick. The, the million man march in which you were invited to speak to represent for black Catholics in America. Where's your speech at with all of them? Legendary activist, artist, and clergy. Thomas feels the cramp in his stomach is hurting. I don't expect you to understand. No, I don't think you understand. You should sit down. I'm not trying to hate or whatever you and the old boy had in the past. What do you mean by that? This thing is. What? what, what? What? He was a mentor. My mentor. Maybe if you had someone like him, you wouldn't have made the choices you made. Be sick like you are. Man. I didn't need no mentor, Donald. I had a big brother. I need to step back. I need to say. Father, mother exits. Thomas kneels over. End of play. Another round of applause for those amazing actors from this play. We are now going to have our post-show conversation. So can uh, the moderator and the panelists please come up? Um, while they are coming on stage, I just want to thank you guys again for being here for these readings that are part of the Prelude Festival. We are very, very thankful and grateful. Um, you want to come down, you, some of you back there, you want to come a little further, you can't come closer, you can't. Otherwise, let's have a chat. So let's give them all another round of applause. <laughs> Wonderful place. And can we just go go down and bring it up and let's do introductions just one more time for me? So oh, I need to see that. <laughs> I'll listen to you all here because I can go. Okay. I'm Kelly Barat, um, uh, uh, founder and executive director of Pride Time Festival and uh, director of new work at the Apollo. <laughs> I'm the, oh, I'm Kemi Younger Casino. I wrote, oh, what am I? Hi, I'm Kaylee Spivy. Uh, yep, one, two, okay, yeah. Hi, Dennis A. Allen the second. Dennis A. Allen II, who also directed all four excerpts of yes, yes. also directed, that's no, sorry, she acted and wrote in her own play, and she also acted in Haley's play. Who are you? I'm Keith Joseph Atkins, I'm the new Black Fest artistic director and the playwright of one of the plays. I'm Robin Walker Murphy. I'm moderating, and that's also give a huge round of applause you because the actors are stand. One more time. You are all so incredible. Thank you so much for sharing your time and talent. Um, and just thank you all so much for your incredible words. Um, my first question is um, Nina Simone talked about how the role of the artist is to reflect the times. 
I'm curious if do you all feel like that is your role as artists and playwrights? Do you feel that kind of pressure or do you just feel like it's mm -hmm. time for us to kind of free ourselves from that thought? Haley, why don't you start? I see you doing like this. <laughs> That's my good eye contact. <laughs> okay, so the question is, do I feel like two year old black? I mean, I feel like I have to say yes, even if you don't intend to. We all are a reflection of the world that we grow up in and what we see. Um, and the things that you write comes from your experiences or fears or desires, which are shaped by. Um, the environment, I, I guess maybe the artist's job is to do it with a little bit more intentionality than the average person does, because they go about their days. So thank you, Lizzie. Um, it's interesting. I, I think I just write what I consider the truth, and then what your journey with it is like your business. Yeah, it's not mine. And so people take a lot of different things from my writing. So even this piece, People say it's about immigration, but it, other people will be like, oh, this is a, about the relationship between Africans and African Americans, you know, and like recognizing where we come together and when we, where we diverge. Um, and so for me, I just write what I know um, and, and I write people that I know. And then when I look back, it's always people I'm not seeing on my stage or people I'm not seeing on my screen. And so I think I reflect the times of what I see that I can seem to find on the screen or on stage. Thank you. Um, so Dennis and Keith, when you all look at your starting to your process and you're looking at this blank page or maybe maybe not a page, maybe it's a you know your computer screen, your laptop. Um, do you see your words as like weapons? Are you thinking of it like that? Are you thinking of your words as, as the need to talk back to something? <laughs> um, this is his festival, so I will uh, um, acquiesce to that. Yeah, uh, weapons. That's, uh, God, what was it? Hmm. I'll think weapons. I, I see, uh, it's interesting, I, I was thinking about the first question, um, and maybe I can tie it into the second question as well, because I I realized that I think I first, I, I did think that I was writing plays to reflect back um, society so that we could see ourselves. And I realized that I write plays actually so that I could see myself. I think the mirrors actually turn towards me um, and everything that I'm exploring um, is my the, the things that I'm unpacking within myself. And then in that specificity, hopefully it speaks to somebody out there. Um, and so I wouldn't use the term weapons, um, but I would say that the words that, um, the words that I put on the page um, are there to hold me accountable. Um, hold me accountable to myself, to the society, to my community, to the people that I love. Um, and so in, in that way, um, I do recognize the words, but for me. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting question. I think for me, um, there's so much going on in the world for the last, well, since the world began, it's been like, <laughs> but I feel like in the last five years in particular, there has been a lot happening. And it feels like things are moving really quickly. And so for me as an artist, as a human being, I'm dodging the weaponry of society, right? I feel like I'm dodging the artillery that's being thrown at me and I'm forced to kind of navigate. And so for me, like my weaponry is quieting myself and really like really tapping into my inner voice my inner consciousness my spirit as a means to protect myself from all that's going on but what it does for me i think is that it allows me to get much clearer about what i want to say because i could easily just respond to every single thing that's happening in every single moment because i want to you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I go to Clubhouse and I'm arguing with people who are, <laughs> I don't even know these people because I, I just want to participate in what's happening in the world. 
But then I get exhausted by that. So I have to really just sit back and like, okay, okay, just breathe. And what you need to say will come. Right. So I feel like that's that's my process right now. Mm -hmm. It's very, very helpful. Now I was thinking about um uh when I was listening to your piece around, you know, the climate change, you made me think also just about like climate change as science fiction, but not like your piece, because it feels like science fiction is very real. Um, but also to be both oppressed and complicit. Um, to be, you know, to be living in a country where we are oppressed, but then there are things that we are also, you know, complicit in, in terms of, you know, whether it's climate change, whether it's, you know, things are, how as an artist do you all kind of walk that type, like that type of, of like when, like what does it mean to write, you know, in a society where you experience maybe oppression, maybe you don't feel like you're experiencing oppression, but also can be this like duality that I know Du Bois talked about, like that too, but does that come into your, you know, thinking as you're writing your work? <laughs> oh, me, okay. Um, so when I started writing, I used to really focus on trauma and response, right? Um, I really, and I think I was writing what I thought I needed to write as an African woman. I think now I write about power and choice. Mm -hmm. So this story, this the play you saw is actually really a love story between two best friends, but it's framed around this immigration. So like in the actual plays, there's a like a Greek chorus of immigrants. And so they give their own stories um, about their, love re love hate relationship with America. Um, so I think I'm less concerned with oppression or trauma as I used to be, because I actually think we need to start seeing ourselves in a place of power and in a place of making choices, bad choices, because this character makes terrible choices. Um, but that's still power. Like I should have the chance to quit or I should have the chance to fail. Um, and I think I also think there is you can't be what you you can't be what you can't see. Mm -hmm. So all we see is like oppression, oppression, oppression. I start to think that that's my that's my course. No, 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 no. I'm here for suck life. Okay. <laughs> so I <laughs> I write a line of like there's always comedy in my stuff because I want to laugh and I, I want people to find joy because I think I want people to see someone that that is full, that is complicated, that is powerful, that is making everyday decisions like we all do. And so I think I, I tend not to focus on that. I found that really interesting the way the pieces were curated because we're thinking about survival and resistance, like the theme for this, this panel. It seemed even like the diversity of the voices and the diversity of the experience is like resistance, especially when it comes to being like a black artist where there is like this kind of danger of this kind of single story and Chilamada that Nietzsche talks about. So I also, also felt like that. But also, Kimmy, I want to say to you that I found myself like a many one of the lines in the play because I'm so used to being in a play or anywhere with someone saying like, we are all immigrants. And when you had the character say, not all of us, for, that was so liberating for me because that there's, an, there's like a way in which the uh, Black American experience is invisibilized through the immigrant experience as if you've always like, you know, so I just really wanted to say that I completely just appreciated that. So Haley, in your story with Jeannie and Truth, um, how was that piece um, how did that piece come about for you? Where, where, where did that, where was kind of the origin of that piece? I think um, I'm very fascinated by people who use intellectualism as a weapon um, and what our relationship to truth is and whether or not we are using truth in a way that is meant to actually set ourselves and other people free, like we claim it is, or if we're using truth or observations as a tool to gain power, status in a room, um, get what we want from other people, shame people who we don't like for some other random reason, but disguise it with the, uh, well, I thought you do to say this, um, kind of game. And I feel like it's a game that's just being played really intensely right now. Um, 
via social media and then it comes off of social media it comes into just our personal social groups work environments um, and it's just something that at, like when you're speaking power of truth and like you're for truth power and like you're I have a lot of questions about it and sometimes it's so beneficial and sometimes it's really dangerous and I think it's scary and hard to navigate that whenever you're having conversations with others. I have like a couple, two more questions. So Dennis, um, time and place seem to play a huge role like in your piece. How did you come up with time and place? Like why did you put us there for this particular time? Um, yeah, the the piece that is being reimagined or that, that inspiring piece was set in 64. Um, and a lot was happening in 64. Yeah, uh, assassination of the presidents, segregation, Jim Crow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that was that was purposely done by Shannon. And so I was thinking, what what time period um can I flash forward to? Um, that was just as charged, right? And so you had the Million Man March, uh, the week before the Million Man March, OJ got off, um, right? We, you had all these things happening at, at the same time. And I was like, oh, that's, that's, that's where, that's my jumping off point. That's where we need to start to have, uh, we can have, I think, conversations about um, in the same way that we'll have about the pandemic and January 6th and right we just have these inflection points and so this this is I think that 95 time was such a very specific time for hip-hop um uh the killing of rapper like so much was happening um in in that moment um that I was like oh okay if this is a period piece um it, it hurts my heart to say period piece because what was that yeah. that's how old I am but uh <laughs> The period piece. Um, this, I think, this is the period that we need to reflect on and just and and look back and and see um, what what's the same um, and how we if we move forward from there. Um, Keith, you built such an intriguing character for uh, your protagonist, and he was he was flawed, um, but there was still, of course, a father who loved his child, complicated relationships, who was loved with his own father. Did you think intentionally about building this black male character who had flaws, but also, you know, was looking for, you know, compassion and love and all those? Did you intentionally build the character in that way? Oh, that's a great question. I think um, I thought more about him being aware that he would not have get any compassion. From him. Um, I think that for a lot of black men in particular, um, and I think it's the same for brown men and also black and brown women, there is a given that you're gonna have to walk into a space and no one's gonna believe you. People are gonna second guess you, they're gonna vilify you, demonize you, uh, whether or not it's a workspace, whether or not it's something. <laughs> but, but I think that I thought about that. I thought about like, nobody's gonna, they're not gonna buy this. What did you do wrong? And I want him, I wanted him to really just go deep and really just trying to interrogate himself to find out if he has done something in his life. And is this the reason why this young girl's daughter has left him? You know? And the answer to that is he hasn't done anything but be a human being, you know, and give him the opportunity and the grace to redeem himself, you know, for himself. Uh, I think that's I think that's really powerful. Um, and my last question for the group, um, you alluded to this, of course, there is a lot of pain, death and destruction happening in the world right now. And we're also living in America in a country where we're about to in the next year, go through an election year that's about to be I mean, hopefully it won't be too wild and crazy, but it's looking like it won't be too wild and crazy. Fine. What do you want to say next? I'll start with you. I feel like I've been starting a lot. You said, I didn't come to America to suffer. Or anyone, anyone. As you're thinking about, if, are you, if, are there stories that you still 
you know, want to tell, and not even necessarily that it has to be in connection to what we're going into or we're currently now. You know, I think it's hard. I think, um, you know, inspiration comes from many places, but I'm just curious. So just to, either you can respond to it in the sense of like based on what we're facing or just like a, the story that's within you. And it can go to anybody. That's it. Yeah, it can't let, let, like, uh, actually, yeah. Yeah. hello. Who now? I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I, I, so I, I also, I just wanted to to go back to one of the first questions that you asked, Robert. Absolutely, this question, um, because uh, um, being in this moment as uh, both a an artist and as a curator and as a producer, um, you know, a lot of the times when you're curating, you are so intentionally thinking of what is needed in this moment, um, not just from the gaps that you have in the stories that aren't told and who needs to be on the stage, but also what is needed when your artists cross the threshold. You know, what is needed in terms of the care um, in a moment like this. Um, and uh, and this is where I also just want to take a moment to commend Keith and the new work that um, <laughs> all of the spaces that make this possible, because when we talk about survival, particularly over the past five years, mm. this has been it for me. The Apollo has been that for me. The new Black Fest has been that for me. Sitting in a room and processing in this way has been that for me. So, you know, I think that the intention for me, whether whatever it is that I end up writing, whatever it is that I end up curating, the intention is always starting with the collective effort, the collaborative effort, the community. It starts there and it ends there. So, thank you so much. Um, I think for what's next, not really. Um, referencing what I showed tonight, but I am getting a fierce interest in telling stories that take place in our legal systems. Um, I feel like as I what I notice going on in the world is just how our legal system can be weaponized against us and it's being weaponized against specifically queer and trans people right now. Um, and the manipulation of laws and constitutions and how you can really have a text and if you're just a wise enough, sharp enough lawyer, you can really twist anything to support any cause. Um, but then also if they can do that to us, how can we protect ourselves from that and also use it to advance whatever goals that we have? So I just have a lot of stories in my head right now about people who are fiercely using the legal system and not allowing it to oppress us but you know protect us and use it to our advantage because we can't do that but we just have to have the education and knowledge of how i'm ready <laughs> so i think because i'm always kind of working on multiple projects at the same time in different mediums it's what i realize is i'm sort of always telling the same story over over and over and over again um, every single project, whether it's TV, either a TV project, a film project, and this play, and they're all dealing with the relationship between an African character and an African American character, because I think we don't get to see that. And yet, like, that's been my world. Like, my best friends are African American. I date African Americans. <laughs> like, I'm constantly in those conversations. Um, and they're complex and they're nuanced and like each side gets it right and wrong at the same time. And I feel like there's this pushing of a monolithic idea of blackness and it's, it's not, you know? And so in many ways, I think I'm always investigating what that relationship looks like because I think there's a lot to be gained from that relationship if, because when I, this is a long answer, see? No, it's Wait, great. I would... But like, I, I, I've been seeing a lot on Twitter, be diasporic. Uh, di Tell the truth. Yeah. Diasporic. Yeah. Yeah. Diasporic. Diasporic. Right. Yeah. There's not my first language. They can't. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the wars, right? Uh -huh. Between Africans and African Americans. But when I look at it, like from back home, that's tribalism. And they used to separate us, like, you are this person, you are this person, you are Muganda, you are Matora, so that they could divide and conquer. So when I look at that, I'm like, oh, I've seen this before. And so I think my work is always telling the story of like, no, 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 we need to come together and have 
the tough conversations because I think there's a lot more to gain from the togetherness. Thank you so much for telling those stories because I can't tell you through these Twitter, you know, guys for wars, how people tell me too, I think they don't like us. They meaning all the Africans in the world. And it is such a narrative that feels like it's gaining momentum and your words and your storytelling is, is so powerful and important to come back to it. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. You saw it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we do this all the time. Um, I just want to, I, I think the question is about you see what's next. Um, something Kelly and I were talking about a while ago, um, just talking about curation, but also talking about, because I can, you know, talk about stories and stuff, but I think we also have to talk about protection, right? Like protecting artists. And part of that protection is providing information about survival and resistance. And what does survival look like for brown and black artists in particular in this world that's being crunched by the potential of artificial intelligence and downsizing economically? How do we survive? What is our survival as artists? Are we getting the information about what's really happening when we leave grad schools, when we leave these spaces of readings, like do these plays go on to be produced? What does that look like? Who do we contact? You know, I think that's part of kind of what I'm interested in. Kelly and I were just talking about this a lot, about finding spaces to, to talk about and download with artists about what's next, what's realistic, what's probable. How can you shape shift your expectations with the world that we're living in right now? It doesn't, like what I wanted 15 years ago out of grad school isn't the same thing that's happening in the world right now. I talk about new play development, which I came out of. Nobody talks about new play development and dramaturgs and the importance of dramaturg. Because when I was in grad school, dramaturgs were literally graduating for the first time. So I came out, you know, writing plays where there's a dramaturg attached to me, right? Now it's kind of like, oh, you got a dramaturg. I don't know, what is a dramaturg? Do you need the dramaturg? Like, but I think that's a legit thing, meaning that what does the world look like right now? And how do we inform ourselves about the reality of what we're playing? Mm -hmm. Because it is a serious business. And I think it's important for us to know that there is a low ceiling in theater in particular around opportunity. I think that there's certain, and, I, and also when it's, I'm interested in changing that dynamic about who's chosen, who's anointed. I think those things are dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. There should be spaces for everybody to tell their story. Everyone has a right to tell a story. And so can we create spaces and institutions that allow everybody to stand forth, right? Which is why one of the reasons why artificial intelligence is such a danger and perhaps a blessing is because it will prop may allow for everybody to figure out a way to tell the story. Interesting. Yeah, that is I just want to put that up. No, okay. that was beautiful. I did it. Yeah, I should have let you go last. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I think um, my through line, the story I keep telling um, when I connect my plays, I'm always dealing with untreated trauma um, and specifically untreated trauma in the um, Black African-American community. And so um, I don't know what's next and I do know what's next. Um, we are one big bowl of untreated trauma. Um, and so uh, when it comes to material, uh, I am not lacking in, in that. Um, <laughs> uh, and, I, I, and I think this particular play is um, the play that I presented today um, is just, it's the beginning and I'm still working on it. Um, uh, hope, hopefully to find it a home at some, at some point um, because I, there's an intimacy that's missing on stage. Mm -hmm. um, and we're talking about survival, resistance, and intimacy. Um, is a, there's an intimacy that's missing um, because I think the people who are telling the stories that are supposed to be my stories don't love me. Um, so because they don't love me, I don't see myself. And so I'm really, I'm really interested in telling love stories, whatever that love story. I mean, we all just saw four love letters to a community. And I think um, I'm, I'm interested in continuing telling those stories. And Kelly, let's end with you giving me the last word. 
what can we expect from the Apollo in response to this idea of survival and like what do we, what can we expect? Well, I, I think a place like the Apollo is um, a, the building itself is a testament to survival. Mm -hmm. uh, that building, the Apollo, mm -hmm. is um, it's heading towards turning a hundred years old. Um, we just had a massive festival this past weekend that um, where you know Ta-Nehisi Coates talked about there is no place where we are not. We are everywhere. Mm -hmm. Black people are everywhere. Um, you know, uh, we are. Um, uh, a globally recognized uh, cultural force. Um, and if that doesn't give us hope, um, I don't know what doesn't. Um, but also, you know, we are, you know, under the, 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 the program that I sit on top of that the New Black Fest um, is a part of, you know, we're also expanding and about to take over two new brand new theaters that are ours, mm -hmm. um, you know, for us, by us. <laughs> and um, and it, it's, it's incredible. And um, and that space is for us, and I it, it's just um, we built that, and um, and this new canon of American work that includes these four stories that happened here, um, that is a home uh, uh, for for us, and um, and so it's just a it, it's an incredible incredible moment um, that we're all a part of, and. Uh, yeah, I I don't even know how to how to say it better except to say yes, it's 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 here, we're here, and uh, and we're gonna keep on going <laughs> here for the next hundred years. Well, thank you all for coming out. Keith, did you want to say anything before we wrap up? Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Oh, any questions? <laughs> all right. Yes, please. Kelly has to leave. She has kids. Well, that's a good question. Um, how, like, what, how would I design a, a drum? Yeah. No, go ahead. I mean, how, because, because. Okay, this is, when we're talking about uh, dramaturgs, no, no, I said dramaturgs were a thing. Were a thing. Yes. Okay, but they are, I mean, are they? Well, it's not the same, it's not the same, it looks differently. It looks differently. Yeah, yeah, there was a time, like, you know, plays like Rent, yeah. right, um, Jonathan Larson passed away, but his dramaturg continued to build that story because she was attached. Yeah. She was an equal player in a way. It was a part, it's a sort of like a partnership. I think now dramaturgs sort of sit behind. Um, and they used to be where they were actually at the table as an equal player. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily like out here trying to like create a dramaturg institution, but you know what I mean? Like I just I was just saying, like for me, like it just things look differently now. Right, because I don't know what the drama is. It's something I'm trying to know what it is. It's like I've had a drawing in the book for the Muslim poetry, we were talking about intellectual uh, weaponry, which I thought kind of like blew up my brain. There's one thing that I can't remember what it is, but I remember it, it made my brain, my brain drop down to my uh, feet. But, and uh, with uh, Dennis, if you're playing about uh, the, we're going to talk about the first uh, your play, about Donald, mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, my first thing was like, well, it's not the first play to bring in an absent or minor character to make them the star of the show. It's like a, there's like a whole history of that across the union. Mm -hmm. And like your, your explanation to that was, was a very visceral mm -hmm. one. And so the question I asked the dramaturgical question in my mind was just like, how did you find that first? How did the first one in the season go go into that and become kind of the shape of the of the whole thing? I don't know the whole play that you play, but like basically, to just go back to you, you see, it's just like it's to me like it's just like the most boring thing to do in the world. 
Well, I mean, I mean, I do know some great dramaturgs. Haley is an amazing dramaturg, actually. She's she's a dramaturg on two projects that we've developed with the New Black Fest and the Apollo. Um, I think that for me, like giving a, a, an artist, a creative artist, um, who is very much interested in language, who's very very much interested in the shaping of story, who comes to the table with compassion for artists and not trying to silence them, but actually advocate for them. Like that to me is a dramaturg. Um, a dramaturg allows, provides space. I mean, I think we can probably speak better because she's actually a legit dramaturg. A current today dramaturg. But for me, like that to me um, is ideal. I feel like what's happened is that dramaturgs are now sort of a secondary thought. Maybe we don't need them. Um, what is it? You know what I mean? Like all that, right? And I think it's always great for a writer in particular to have an ally at the table. Because sometimes directors are allies, but they get busy because they also have to ally for the actors. And some of the actors and the writers are not always on the same page. And sometimes dramaturgs can actually help bridge, bridge that gap. So I think that, you know, that's what I would like to see. But did you want to speak to that, Yogi, before we wrap up? I mean, yeah, I would say when it's the role of dramaturgs play on projects, it, a lot of it I feel like also comes down to money and how much money a group of people have to offer. So one of the reasons I feel like dramaturgs are often put towards the back is because when you're trying to cut costs and you're looking at people in the room, they tend to be one of the first roles to go. Um, so when you're on projects like right, where they have money to put, the dramaturgs really get some freedom to do their work. To your question about if, you know, the way I ideally would shape it, I would say that I would love a world where every production has a dramaturg that's attached to the playwright, where they're having those long, intimate conversations about what the intentions of the play are. And the dramaturg's job is to be their lawyer almost and make sure that they can make sure everyone in the room understands. The other thing I would have them do is a lot of community engagement which is, okay, you want to write a piece that's about priests, okay, let's go talk to some priests. Okay, it's priests in the Bronx, okay, let's go find some churches in the Bronx and some priests, and then maybe we should do a reading there. And so then having not just a theoretical idea of what the play is, but also finding ways to really reach out to community members, bring them into the theaters, or bring ourselves to them. So again, in terms of like the we tell it, no, no. And unfortunately, we're not going to be able to go any further into that because we have to just wrap it up. But I'm sure if you want to talk to these people after the, after we wrap, you can do that. But thank you all so much for coming out. And thank you to all the amazing artists for the wonderful